Hi, and welcome to the fifth and final lesson in this series on defining your own data sets through the Sage Intelligence Connector module. In the last lesson, I shared how you can further enhance your data sets by doing things like adding custom expressions to your containers or applying filters to your queries. I ended with my two containers and the reports I created from them pretty much complete. I also confirmed their functionality by running them out. This was into two separate workbooks, and I highlighted that for my receivables and payables dashboard, I would need both data sets run out into a single workbook. In this lesson, I'm going to start by showing how this can be achieved through union reports. Once done, there are a few last tweaks I'd like to make to my reports, and I'll then be in a position to complete my dashboard. Following this, I'll end things off by providing a summary of all we've seen throughout this series. I've opened up my report manager and I'm going to add a union report to my Sally's Receivables and Payables folder. This is done by selecting the folder and then clicking Add Report on the Home tab. As you should be familiar with, you're then given the option to add a standard report or a union report. This time, I'm going to select Union Report. You then need to give it a name, and I'm going to call mine Receivables and Payables Dashboard. After clicking OK, a list of all the reports in your report manager are shown, and you now need to choose the ones you would like to include in the union. You can see my Accounts Payable and Accounts Receivable ones listed. I'm going to select both of them and click OK. You can then see the report added to the folder with a green icon indicating that it is a union report. In case you're still feeling a bit fuzzy about union reports, they are simply single reports which allow you to run a number of standard reports together, outputting the data from each standard report to a separate sheet in the same workbook. When referenced in a union report, a standard report is referred to as a subreport. If I double click on my union report and then on union subreports, you can see the subreports that are linked to it. Also, when I do this, you can see the subreports appear under the union subreports tab in the properties window. The sheet number that the data from each subreport will be output to is shown next to them. At the moment, both of mine say 1, which means both subreports will output to the first sheet in Excel. This is all right if both reports have the same columns and contain like data, but since my reports include different types of records, I would like one of them placed on a separate sheet. So I'm going to change the output sheet number of my accounts payable subreport to sheet 3. I can do this by right clicking on the subreport in the Union Subreports tab, selecting Properties, and then changing the value in the Output Sheet Number field. After clicking OK, you can see it updated in the tab. You might ask, first of all, why change the value to 3 and not 2? This is because I have the option Parameters on Second Sheet checked under the properties of the union report. And since I don't want the data from my accounts payable subreport to overwrite the parameter information, I have chosen to use the next available sheet. This is always good practice when making use of union reports, outputting your first subreport to sheet 1, and then your second subreport to sheet 3, and so on. Then you might also ask, why change the sheet number of the accounts payable report when it is shown first in the list? This is because in a union report, the subreports actually run in reverse order. So in this case, my accounts receivable one will run first, and then my accounts payable. Regardless of the order the reports are listed in, they will output to the set sheet number. But if you want to keep things looking neat and list them sequentially, you can do so either by selecting them and dragging them into position or by using the move up and move down buttons on the right of the pane. I'm going to run my union report out now. Each subreport executes in succession, beginning with accounts receivable with its cutoff date parameter requested. 
and then Accounts Payable with its cutoff date parameter requested. Once the workbook loads, you can see that I have my receivables on the first sheet, report parameters on the second sheet, and payables on the third sheet, with no invoice due dates extending past the cutoffs that I entered during the report run. What you may have noticed is that the date I entered for each parameter was the same, and for my dashboard this will always be the case. You can imagine that if I have a union report with 10 subreports and each one required the same parameter to be entered at runtime, this would be a lot of repetition. This is another instance where pass-through variables can help. Once one is set, it can be applied to other subreports in a union report during a report run. That being said, it's good practice to add the parameter that captures the pass-through variable to the first subreport that is executed and then make the necessary changes to the rest of the subreports that will make use of the pass-through value. I'm going to do this for my reports, but before starting, another point worth mentioning is that you may have a union report that is made up of several standard reports which could be in different folders, and you may want to make a change to one of them. Rather than looking through each folder trying to find the right one, once you have displayed the list of subreports below your union report, you can get to it easily by right-clicking on the one you want to work with, selecting Go to Subreport, and it will be highlighted. With my subreports, the parameter to capture the cutoff date value is already applied to the first report that is run in the union report, my accounts receivable one. So I'm going to leave it as it is. Then, for my accounts payable, I'm going to remove the parameter from it as the whole point is to avoid having to enter the cutoff value twice. I still need the value from my first report to be applied to my accounts payable one, and I can do this by using a filter. I'm going to add one which sets the invoice due date field to be less than my pass-through variable. All the changes I need to make are done, and I'm going to run out my union report again. This time, my receivables executes, and I'm prompted for the invoice cutoff date through the parameter that is part of it. After selecting a suitable date and clicking OK, the value is saved to the pass-through variable and then applied to the report SQL query, filtering the records that are returned. My payables report then executes, and the saved cutoff date is also applied to its SQL query through the filter that I added to the report, avoiding the need to select it a second time. The data from each report is output to the correct sheets in Excel, and I'm now ready to design my dashboard. I shared a lot on designing dashboards in the last series, so this time around I'm going to work through the process fairly quickly. I'm going to start with my first receivables gauge, which is a chart showing my top five customers by value. In other words, the five customers that owe me the most money over the next few weeks. I'm going to create a pivot table from the data in sheet one. I'm going to choose raw data as the source, place it on a new sheet, and select the necessary fields for it. These are customer name and extension amount. I'm then going to add a filter to display only the top five items and sort the data by extension amount from highest to lowest. I can then create my pivot chart from the pivot table. I'm going to place this on a new sheet, which will be my dashboard sheet. I'm not going to do anything more with it now, and I'm going to move on to the same chart for my payables. In other words, the five vendors that I owe the most money to over the next few weeks. The setup is identical to the previous chart, except that it is based on the data in Sheet 3.
So after adding the pivot table, which I'll do to the fourth sheet as well, I'm going to select the fields vendor name and extension amount. I can then add the top five filter and sort the data. as well as create the pivot chart. Which I'll place to the right of my receivables one. I can then create my third and fourth gauges, which are pivot tables, showing the top five invoices that are due. Starting with my receivables again, I'm going to go back to my first sheet, add a new pivot table, and this time place it directly in my dashboard sheet below my first chart. I'm going to include the fields invoice number, customer name, my custom number of days due field, and extension amount. In my data, the number of days due for an invoice is repeated for each sales line that is part of an invoice. So in my pivot table, because the calculation on the field is a sum, each value is a multiplication of the actual value and the number of lines in each invoice, which is obviously incorrect. Because the value for each line is identical, I can get around this by changing the field calculation to average. Using min or max would also do the trick. I'm then going to add a bottom five filter on the number of days due field. And sort on the field from smallest to largest. Then finally, I can add the pivot table for my payables in the same way that I did the previous one. And I'm going to place it in the empty space on my dashboard sheet. I'm going to include the fields invoice number, vendor name, the custom number of days due field, and extension amount. Here I also need to change the calculation on the number of days due field. And I can then add the filter. and sort the data also on the same field. The basic design of my dashboard is complete, and I can now use the usual formatting functions in Excel to make it look more attractive. For example, renaming some of the fields and my gauges to make them more user-friendly, changing the color scheme, adding titles and inserting my company logo. I shared a lot of information on this in the last series, so I'm not going to worry about going through the details now. 
Instead, I'm going to jump ahead to where all this has been done. Once you finish with yours, always remember that you need to save your workbook back to your report in the Report Manager using Save Excel Template in order for your changes to persist. And the process of saving to a union report is exactly the same as for a standard report. As I mentioned at the start of this series, for Sally's necessities, my dashboard gives me an understanding of the customers that owe me the most money and a heads up on the payments that are due in the short term, allowing me to follow up on them if I need to. This is on the receivables side. On the payable side, it tells me the vendors that I owe the most money to and the payments I need to provision for in the short term. Overall, it gives me a sense of my cash flow for my receivables and payables over the given time frame. One idea I've had to extend it is to include a calculation which subtracts my total accounts payable from my total accounts receivable to give me my actual cash flow for the given period. This wouldn't be hard to do. Why don't you give it a try? In this series, I've shown you that apart from just being able to make use of the standard reports that ship with your Sage Intelligence product or design your own based on the standard data sets, you're able to access, shape, and report on the data that makes a difference to your business. This is enabled through the Connector module. In the first lesson, I provided an introduction to the Connector discussing the Object Window, Properties Window, and Menu Bar explaining the different objects that make up the data object hierarchy and ending off with how to add your own connections. This put us in a position to begin adding containers. I started out explaining this by adding single tables and then moved on to designing a more detailed container using the graphical join tool, completing the basic data set for my accounts payable. This also allowed me to share some theory on relational databases. In the third lesson, I stepped things up by creating the data set for my accounts receivable using SQL. This started by first making use of a SQL join type container. I then showed you how you can convert containers by changing mine to a SQL query type one, which allowed me to highlight the differences between them. In the lesson, I also introduced you to and built upon some basic SQL expressions. With the basic source queries of my two datasets complete, in the fourth lesson, I showed you how you can further customize your containers by doing things like adding custom expressions or making use of functions like filters. I showed how these can be applied in various ways depending on the type of container in question, and I built a little more on the SQL knowledge provided in the third lesson. Having my two datasets run out into different workbooks through two separate reports in this last lesson, I've shown how you're able to combine different data sets through the use of a union report, allowing you to create a single view from different classes of information. Then, after explaining how pass-through variables can be used for more than just capturing parameters in a SQL query type report, I finished off creating my dashboard, seeing the fruits of my initial work in the connector. Although I've covered a lot in this series and the previous two, this isn't all the functionality provided by Sage Intelligence, and I encourage you to go and investigate some of the other features that might be of value to you and your business. Some examples are using a consolidation report to combine data from multiple companies if you work with more than one, making use of add-ins with your reports in the Report Manager to perform handy functions, sharing your reports with your colleagues and counterparts through the distribution options found in Excel, or scheduling the running of your reports through the Windows Task Scheduler. You can find information on these and other topics on the Sage Intelligence Learning Portal. All in all, I hope that you can see how Sage Intelligence can be a friend to your business, as it has been to mine. Until we meet again, goodbye.